Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew, the 14th chapter, beginning at the 22nd verse. Glory to Christ our Saviour. As soon as the meal for the 5,000 was finished, Jesus insisted that the disciples get in the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the people. With the crowd dispersed, he climbed the mountain so he could be by himself, find some peace and pray. He stayed there alone late into the night. Meanwhile, the boat was far out to sea and the wind came up against it and they were battered by the waves. At about four o'clock in the morning, Jesus came towards them walking on the water. They were scared out of their wits. A ghost, they said, crying out in terror. But Jesus was quick to comfort them. Courage, it's me. Don't be afraid. Peter, suddenly very brave, said, Master, if it's really you, come to me to come to you on the, wolf, on the water. Jesus said, come. Jumping out of the boat, Peter walked on the water to Jesus. But when he looked down at the waves churning beneath his feet, he lost his nerve and began to sink. He cried, Master, save me. Jesus didn't hesitate. He reached down and grabbed his hand and then he said, Faint heart, what got into you? The two of them climbed into the boat and the wind died down. The disciples in the boat, having watched the whole thing, worshipped Jesus, saying, This is it. You are God's Son, for sure. Give thanks to the Lord for his glorious gospel. Praise Christ our Lord. Would you like to sit down, please? pray that I may speak in the words of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Although they're quite dramatic, those readings that we've just heard, and uh, we try to put the drama into them, and using the message version does allow some different forms of drama and different words to come in sometimes. The underlying theme running through them is silence. Quietness, peace, the power of silence, the opportunities of silence, sometimes the way in which communication between God and hum humanity is revealed and achieved through silence. Silence, of course, has been the subject of many discussions. There's an irony there, isn't there? And it's also the subject of many songs, one of my favourites, Please Don't Sing It Unless You Want To In The Quietness Of Your Hearts. Simon and Garfunkel, The Sound Of Silence. Hello darkness, my old friend, I've come to talk with you again. Because a vision, softly creeping, left its seeds while I was sleeping. And the visions that were planted in my brain still remain within the sounds of silence. <coughs> wonderful song, wonderful song. And it talks about silence as an old friend that visits you in darkness and stillness and plants a seed within you, plants a seed in my brain as God. I'm not sure who wrote it, probably Paul Simon wrote the words, I imagine. But within the Bible, the analogy of silence and quietness is often used to refer to refreshment as well, a time of revelation. In the Old Testament reading today, we hear of the prophet Elijah trying to listen or to hear from God and to meet with God, struggling all over the place. The story starts with one of those great under, understatements that you often get, which always make me smile. The understatement was lit, is linked to that magical number 40, that biblical number 40. The writer says, 
After he'd eaten, God had fed him, Elijah walked for 40 days and 40 nights, and then he crawled into a cave because he was tired. I bet he was. <laughs> I bet he was absolutely tired. He knows that he needed to hear from God and to search from God. And so he starts, once he wakes up and has got over his tiredness, searching on the mountain. And mountains, of course, are often places where someone in the Bible may have an encounter with God. We see it in our New Testament reading and our Gospel reading. Moses and the tablets, Abraham, when he went to sacrifice his son Isaac, and you can think of many more. But this doesn't work for Elijah, poor boy. All he heard was the rushing wind so strong it caused an earthquake. And then there was fire, terrifying, destructive. And yes, as you know, God was not in the fire. Could this be a very strong hint of the devil trying to at work, trying to deceive, lead the prophet to a darker place? Because we need to remember that Elijah was already suffering from depression. But then came the silence. Elijah wrapped a mantle, a scarf, something warm protecting him around himself and in the still, small voice. He heard the calm voice of God, the love of God, the word of God. God telling him what to do and exactly how to do it. Well, I have to say, lucky Elijah. I wish God would tell me that sometimes as well, so clearly. He heard God and he knew it was him. It was not some anonymous person telling him what to do or trying to cause pain, trouble, and hurt. He knew it was God. He heard God speak, and Elijah trusted and was aware of God's love for him. The things that God said were gonna happen, lots of kings being anointed, and then lots of people being slayed, but 7,000, was it 7,000? Yes, 7,000 souls. We're going to be kept back. The things that God said were going to happen weren't exactly what you want to wake up to on breakfast news. Very Old Testament. But in the midst of that, God's care of the saving is evident, as well as God's role. And so then we come to the other end of the spectrum of the two readings. We come to Jesus walking on the water and Peter trying to do the same. At the moment, we're hearing so many of these well-known stories because we're reading Matthew's Gospel in our, in our Bible. We've run through that this year. And we're following all these as he brings together these miracle stories into one long dialogue with one following from the other. And we've had them over the past few weeks. Last week, we heard about the feeding of the 5,000 men and more importantly, in my opinion, the women and the children which made up the numbers, and I imagine did a lot of the stuff as well. And today's gospel story is what happened next. Once again, tiredness comes in, a pattern emerge. Jesus needed a break. He was really busy, he'd had a terribly busy time feeding these 5,000 plus, and he's tired, he's wrung out, he needs that space, he needs to re recharge, to reflect, to ponder, to chill, to get ready for the next thing. I understand exactly where he was at. We confession, the only time I really miss smoking, and I was a, a heavy smoker for many years, is after a Sunday morning service. I used to get home to the vicarage in Webley, sit in the garden, cup of coffee, 20 vents in the hedges, and sit there and enjoy the coffee and one, maybe two cigarettes as the day just reflected by. Thank goodness, I don't have to do that now. But, uh, but I do miss it occasionally. And Jesus did similar. I'm not saying he went up and had a cigarette. Not at 
so on. Well, but you never know. One day they'll know these have been invented. He sent the disciples away. He said, you've got to get to the other side. Got on the boat. Off you go. He went up the hill. He had a seat. And he prayed. He probably reveled in the silence. Allowed it to wash over him. A silence that was peaceful and safe. Maybe even felt like night time. And he could talk to God without being interrupted. And he stayed there till four in the morning. Hello darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again. We don't know what the conversation was. And that to me is a real joy. Because prayer is often private. A father and son in confidence, a mother and daughter in confidence, a mother and son, a father and daughter. However you see the discussion. That's the personal moment between God and the people of God. And it's the same for us today. We too have that ability to have that conversation, that communication. And it's free. One of the great joys of praying is nobody says, press button one for sin, press button two for indulgences, press button three for whatever. It's just there. It's perfect. I will give to drink without cost from the water of the spring of life, God says. He said it in Revelation. We heard it at Ruby's funeral on Monday. Wonderful verse. But after this peaceful interlude, reality kicks in. Jesus has to go back to real life. Not surprisingly, a storm had blown up. I don't know if you find that, but I do. It's like getting home after a really busy day and getting a very difficult and unjust email. It's what life is about now, and I get really sad when spiritual attacks still happen every single day, and particularly to those who are trying their best. The waters get stormy and they get rough. And we have to cross them, just like Jesus did. He had to deal, as, G as the disciples did, with the ravages of the, sa of the waves. But it's different for him. They were in the boat, being tossed about. He had to make the decision, how do I get there? And so Matthew shares one of these great, wonderful stories. Jesus walks on the water, wow. Lucky Jesus, what an opportunity. And the disciples saw this. They saw this as a sign, a message of hope, an outward sign of an innermost strength and healing. A wonderful thing. And Jesus said to them, do not be afraid of the storm. Worked for Liverpool Football Club this season and continues to work. He said, rise above it. I will be there to give you strength. Peter, of course, reacted immediately, as only Peter would. He clambered out the boat, I put here, I think I want to say leapt out the boat. And remember, Peter was my size plus, so I imagine that little boat had quite an effect as Peter went over, over the side. And as soon as he began to struggle, though, he called out, and Jesus answered him. Jesus reached out his hand and held him. They get into the boat and suddenly the disciples just see again. And Matthew makes the point. They say it, he says they saw and they truly believed he was and is the Son of God. Because a vision softly creeping left its seeds while they were sleeping and the vision that was planted in their brain still remains. The seeds burst into life. The seeds from the actions, from the positive actions of Jesus. This has not been an easy week. But I gain huge strength as I read about Jesus feeding and holding and being there. After the tumult, and sometimes, I knew I wouldn't be able to say that word, tumult, when I wrote it. After the tumult, and sometimes signs of despair and anger and sadness, 
We can find time in the silence to be in the silence, to reflect. We can see and feel the seeds growing and the hand reaching out and the arms and the smiles reaching out to touch us and to save us. The same hand that feeds us and loves us and stretched out on the cross for us to die because he loved us and still loves us. Maybe we just need to hear that sound of silence. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our hymn, if you're listening on the internet, our hymn isn't the sound of silence. It's a beautiful new version of a hymn called Be Still and Know That I Am God. And you will hear that now. 